everyone. My name is Tal Oppenheimer. I'm a product manager on the Chrome team, and I'm excited to talk about how you can build experiences that work for everyone around the world. So one of the strengths that we know about the web is that it really is everywhere. It's on every form factor, whether it's a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, or even some TVs. It's on every operating system, though it can be a little bit different on some operating systems. And what this really means is that it's also available across the entire world. And what this means is that as we're looking at the, the reach that the web has, the user base for the web really is anyone who has internet access. So if we look at the total number of internet users around the world, and we look at the top 10 countries over the last few years, we see that things have shifted a fair bit in just a few years. So China still remains one of the countries with the most number of internet users. And the US, which used to be second for number of internet users, has actually been surpassed by India. And you'll also see that the growth rates are a little bit different here, uh, with India very much up and to the right, where some of the other countries are, aren't growing as quickly in terms of the number of total internet users. But you also see some other countries coming up here. You see Brazil, you see Russia, Nigeria, and you also see Germany uh, and the UK. But what's really interesting isn't just to look at the snapshot of where our internet users are right now, but take a step back and look at where our potential new internet users are going to be coming from. And so if you look instead at the number of potential new internet users per country, and again, if we look at just the top 10, you see a little bit of a different story here. You'll notice that the US and various countries in Europe aren't here anymore. And instead, you actually see that some of those countries that we saw that already are on the top 10 for the total number of internet users are also on the top 10 for total number of potential new internet users. So you see that countries like India and China, Nigeria, Mexico, and Brazil not only already have a huge number of internet users, but are expected to have even more. And so we expect this to continue to shift over the next several years, so that really the internet users will be accessing experiences around the entire world. And if we look instead at how we are actually developing experiences today, we're all, we're all used to testing on different devices to make sure that the experience looks the way we want, not just on our phone, but on other phones. And we're used to testing on different OSs. But we don't always take that step back and look at how we can actually build our experience from the ground up with a global audience in mind. And the reality is that everyone uses the internet differently. I'm sure everyone in this room uses the internet differently. But as you look towards different countries and uh, different people who come from various backgrounds and maybe are interacting with the internet for the first time on a mobile device, the behaviors and patterns that they're going to be using to access the internet are just going to be a little bit different. But what we've also noticed by thinking about this for the last few years in particular is that things are also changing really, really quickly. And that it's not just a matter of figuring out what's going on right now, but where are things headed and really responding to things as they change. So I just want to walk through a few of the things to keep in mind as you're thinking about building experiences that work for everyone and specifically focusing on some of the changes that we've seen. So the first thing to note here is devices vary. We're all used to this. We've probably in our lifetime with, with smartphone usage uh, had seen how quickly devices vary just with what we have in our own pocket. This is also the case if you take this global stance. But it's more than just the form factor itself of how big the screen is or the dimensions there, and it's actually the capabilities of the device. For example, we actually see that in India, about one-third of users in India on smartphones are regularly running out of storage. And this means that if you're actually asking them to try your experience out and expecting them to download something, you're asking them to make the trade-off of if they want to remove that photo or the video that they have in order to just try your experience. So this can have a really big impact on the number of experiences that people are willing to give a try. But beyond just the amount of storage space on the device, we also see that the device specs themselves are a little bit different, and this can have an impact on how people interact with an experience once they have it. If you look at some of the devices that were sold in the first half of 2017, we see that about 24% of them were under $100. And these devices often just have very different specs to reach this price point. So they'll have less RAM, for example, so less than one gigabyte of RAM or 512 megabytes of RAM. And this can have a big impact on how users are engaging with the device. App switching can be more challenging. They can have out-of-memory crashes. And this can just change the experience that they have. But beyond just the physical device, we also see that access really varies in terms of being able to access the internet in the first place and engage with your experience. We've talked a lot in the past about data costs and how this can be really prohibitive for certain people around the world from accessing the internet. But what's really interesting here is how quickly things are changing. 
So if we look at India, for example, which in the past we've talked about as one of the countries where data costs have been quite prohibitive, we've actually seen things shift quite a bit over the last year. So Reliance Geo, which is a mobile network operator, actually introduced unlimited 4G data for about six months. And this drastically cut down the price of data cost in India. And it wasn't only for Reliance Geo and for 4G networks, but it actually drove down the prices across all of India. And so what we're seeing is as a result of this one thing over the course of 12 months, the cost in India for data has really gone down. And if you look at the cost specifically for one gigabyte per month, you see a, a nice downward trend there. But what I, what I really want to call out is that around Q1 2017, the price for one gigabyte per month dropped below 2% GDP per capita. And 2% GDP per capita is generally accepted by the Alliance for Affordable Internet as the threshold for affordability. So it's when the cost drops below this threshold that we tend to see users feeling more comfortable accessing the internet and not having to make trade-offs about the cost of data when they're thinking about what to, what to actually access. But I do want to take a, make sure to, to note that this is, this is India. So India specifically has seen a huge shift in data costs over the last year, but there are still many countries around the world where data costs aren't even at that 2% threshold. They're actually well above that 5% GNI. And so we're seeing that data cost is still a challenge around the world, but it does have the option of switching very quickly. So it's important to make note of this and to not only plan to build experiences that are conscientious of data usage, but also adapting to the users who are most sensitive and going from there. Now, we all know that data costs can be a challenge in some areas, but we also know that connectivity can be a challenge. I'm sure all of us have experienced the slow connection and, and complained when we have to wait too long for things to load. But this is even more so the case when you take a global look at things. So if we look at a report from earlier this year that looked at the 2016 connectivity landscape, you'll see that 2G data connections are still really common around the world. And even though we're seeing that this is shifting in some countries, it's not changing particularly rapidly. So even in India, with Reliance Geo introducing 4G networks, if you look at estimates from 2017, it still suggests that in 2020, 53% of connections in India will still be 2G. And this is just strictly 2G. This isn't even accounting for the fact that 3G connections can still feel like they're 2G speeds just due to the load. And so this is just strictly 2G connections. So the reality is, is that connectivity challenges aren't going anywhere. And the need for really fast experiences across all of these connection types continues to be really critical for everyone around the world. And as a result of these different conditions that people are using to access the internet, there's also some variations in behavior for how they're actually accessing experiences and what they're doing with them. I just want to call out a few of these that we've, we've seen so far. So one is that downloads are key, especially when it comes to content. So we've seen that connections are slow, data costs can be high, and people can actually spend days offline. But downloading content can actually address all of these. Because you, once, if, once you download content, playback, if it's a media experience, can be really smooth and fast, even if you're on that slow connection. You can re-watch or re-read content multiple times without having to pay for that data again. And for those days that you spend offline because you ran out of a data plan or just don't have any connectivity, or in our scenarios uh, are on a plane or something of the sort, you'll see that you can still access content. And so downloads really is used across the board to address some of these challenges. But beyond just this approach to accessing content, we also see just different behaviors for specific verticals that people might be working on. So another one I want to just call out here is, is payments. When you take a global stance and look at payments, you realize that payments are way more than just credit cards. A lot of us are used to online payments, directly meaning pulling out your credit card, typing it in, or using autofill or any other solution. But this isn't the case around the world. If we look again at India, we actually see that there are 28 times as many debit cards as credit cards in India. So if you're building a solution that assumes that someone has a credit card to be able to go through a checkout flow or purchase the item, you're really only targeting in India a market of about 28 million credit cards in comparison to 818 million debit cards. And so it's really important to think about where your users are and how they're actually experiencing uh, the web and the, the experiences that you're building. And what's more is if you look at this per country and are thinking about who you're targeting, you also see that the government can have a big effect here. So in India, for example, still focusing on payments, the government actually introduced the Universal Payments Interface, or UPI, which specifically focuses on enabling bank-to-bank -bank transfers because of the lack of prevalence of credit cards. And after introducing this, we've actually seen this grow quite a bit 
Most notably, you see a jump there between November and December in 2016. This is because this is when demonetization happened in India, and some of the bills that were commonly used were actually no longer accepted. And so this actually helped drive the adoption of UPI, or alternative payment methods. And what we're seeing as a result is more and more experiences coming up that are leveraging these alternative ways to pay that aren't reliant solely on credit cards. So you have Paytm, or most recently Google also launched Tez, that was trying to think through how we can build an end-to-end -end payments experience that doesn't rely on users just having credit cards. And payments aren't the only thing. This is just one example of many. We also see, as users are coming online from around the world, that a lot of people speak more than one language, and a lot of people don't speak English. And so taking a step back and understanding what language people actually use is also important. In fact, if you look at some of these most rapidly growing countries, we actually see that about 20% of our users from around the world are regularly searching in two or more languages. And so we're seeing that this is already impacting their behavior for how they're interacting with the web and has implications for how we build for them. And so across the board, there's a lot of different considerations that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about how you can build experiences for everyone. But one of the things I just want to jump into first is the web already helps with a lot of these. It can be really daunting to think of, oh, no, there's so many things I need to keep in mind. But the web is fundamentally built to address a lot of these key issues. We know that with the web, it can be easier to, to discover something. If you get a link, if you search for it, and you end up on the page, you've already found it. You don't need to hunt through it. And what more is when you're actually there, you don't need to install it to experience it. By virtue of getting there, you're already experiencing the product and what it has to offer. But we also know that it's not just about getting users to interact with your product for the very first time. You're also hopefully continuing to work on it and make it better. And you want to make sure that your users are getting those updates. And with the web, when they're accessing your experience, they're accessing the most up-to-date version of your experience. And you don't have any challenges of actually updating users to the latest version that you've built. And as a result of all of these, we've also seen that the web can have a tremendous reach. And so these fundamental building blocks have actually allowed the web to grow, especially in line with how, how large the internet access has grown over the past few years. If you look at the top 1,000 mobile web properties compared to the top 1,000 native apps, you'll see that even with the large initial user base, the mobile web audience is growing even faster than native. And this is in part because we've been working on moving the web forward across all browsers. And this has really been an initiative that we've been doing with all of you and a lot of folks around here to make sure that the web platform can offer the capabilities that developers need and that users need. And so we actually today have Service Worker, which is one of the key technologies that you all heard a lot about yesterday, um, supported across some of the most popular browsers around the world. So from Firefox to Opera to Chrome to Samsung Internet and UC Browser, they all have some Service Worker capabilities to make sure that we can provide the best possible experience to our users. But there's more that you can do than just build a website. And so I just want to walk through some concepts to keep in mind based on some of those challenges that we outlined before for how you can build the best possible experience. So just to jump right in, we all know that storage is challenging. We've probably all experienced some storage constraints on our phone. We took too long of a video and now have no more room. We took too many photos, whatever it might be. This is definitely the case around the world as well. And one of the really key opportunities we have here is that PWAs just take less storage. If we look at Ola, for example, which is a popular ride-sharing app in India, you'll see that they already have an iOS app. And their iOS app was about 100 megabytes. They also had an Android app. Uh, their Android app was around 60 megabytes. But they were really focused on how they could increase their reach, specifically targeting Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities in India, where they knew that storage constraints were a real problem. And so they looked into their options there and actually decided to build a progressive web app, specifically to target uh, this this set of users, and to expand their reach to areas where people have more storage constraints. And what they built was a PWA that was 200 kilobytes. I just want to emphasize here, that's, that's kilobytes. I know 200 can look bigger. But that means that they were able to build an experience that was comparable and able to address the key flows that they needed for their users at 1 300th of the size of their native Android app. And that's compared to their Android app, not, not even their iOS app. And so this was huge for actually increasing the reach and the opportunities that they had. And fundamentally, what we're seeing more and more is that PWAs are a key strategy for extending the reach of your experience and making sure that everyone can access it from the get-go and don't have to jump any th through any hoops. And so what you're really doing is making sure that there are no unnecessary barriers 
to trying out your experience. And one of the barriers we talked about before was also around data costs. So I do want to focus on that a little bit. And while we've been seeing things shift in India, India is just one of many countries, and we want to make sure that we're building really for everyone if we're trying to extend our reach as much as possible. So in Chrome, on Android, we've had for a while a feature called Data Saver, which is a server-side proxy for HTTP content to help users save more data. But what we also want is that you as developers know what you can do to specifically identify users who are most data sensitive and adapt your experience. And so what we have here is a save data header. And in Chrome, this maps directly to whether a user has data saver on or off and allows you to see who is the most data sensitive. So this is pretty simple. It's either on or off. And you can figure out whether a user is data sensitive or not. And this is standardized across browsers as well. And then you, depending on your experience, can decide what optimizations to make. So it might be that you replace images, or you choose which images are the most critical for your flow. It might be that you choose to change the bandwidth of video playback or whatever it is. And you can really decide what's right for your user base based on the flows that you know that they need to complete. But what's also really important here isn't just saving users' data and identifying who's, who needs that data saved, but you also want to make sure that you show users when you've saved data. Because if you've saved someone data and they don't know you've saved them data, they don't necessarily feel like they can trust you and that they can continue to use your experience because they're not sure that you won't just use way more of the data than they expect. And we've been taking the same principle with Chrome as well, with showing for data saver users with just one tap so that they can see their data savings and learn to trust that the web is looking out for them and being data conscientious as they're browsing. But beyond just data use, we also know that memory is a constraint, especially as we see more and more devices being sold at $100 price points or lower. And what we want to make sure here is that it's not just about accessing that experience for the first time, but that users are really having a good, rich experience as they're interacting with it. And the first step to solving a problem is always to know what the problem is. So the first piece here is really to know your memory usage. And Paul Irish will be talking a lot more about this later today, uh, so definitely check out his talk. But one of the key things to identify here is understanding where your memory usage is going and what opportunities you have. And memory usage isn't an equivalent constraint for everyone, so it's also important to identify which devices and which users need us to make the most improvements. And so we have device memory header uh, and a device memory JavaScript API that can allow you to identify the devices that are most constrained. And we've been keeping these same principles with Chrome as well. We actually did a similar effort around our V8, and specifically by focusing on devices with one gigabyte of RAM or less, we're able to decrease our heap memory consumption by 15%. And so the main thing here is to make sure you're keeping a very close eye on your memory usage and specifically targeting the users that are most challenged by this constraint to make sure that you're delivering a really high quality experience and that it's not that someone will access your experience and then have an out of memory crash, because that's not good for anyone. But beyond just the device considerations, we also know that connectivity can be a challenge. And this goes across the board. This happens here, this happens in India, this happens in Indonesia, it happens really around the world. Just the frequency of some of the challenges that can vary. And so one of the important things with connectivity that we talked about yesterday is that you can build across the board sort of fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging experiences. But I want to focus specifically on reliable here, because this is one of the considerations that comes up the most when you're looking at a global scale. And so, similar to what we said before with memory, the first step here, again, is to, to know your connection and know what the challenges you actually face are. So we have the Network Information JavaScript API. And this is something that you can use to figure out what situation is your user currently in, so you can adapt accordingly. In the past, we've talked about downlink max. And so downlink max would give you the information about the maximum throughput based on the user's connection. So if they're on 3G or 2G or 4G, what's the maximum throughput for that particular connection type? But we also know that that's not necessarily representative of what they're actually experiencing. So you can also look at downlink or round trip time, which will actually estimate these values based on recent connections that we've seen in that area. So we use our network quality estimator to give you more information about the actual experience that the user is getting. And beyond this, sometimes you might need the, the more detailed uh, pieces of downlink and RTT, but sometimes you just need the high level summary. And so we also have effective type. And this can give you the details of, based on the current downlink and RTT, what is the effective connection type that the user is actually experiencing? So they might be technically connected to a 3G network. And so downlink max might give you the maximum throughput that a 3G network could provide. But the effective type would let you know that, actually, this is functionally a 2G network. And you should treat it like a 2G network and make sure that you're creating the best experience from there. 
But of course, knowing it isn't enough. You also want to make sure to adjust the experience accordingly. And we've had a lot of different topics and presentations about how to make sure your, your site is as fast as possible. But I do just want to highlight that service worker, which is something we talk a lot about for fully offline options, is also really, really helpful for addressing intermittent connectivity or slow connections, whether it's doing request timeouts when you're on slow connections or just caching content so you can handle those intermittent connection situations. It's really important to think about how service worker can be used to build in resilience. And building for intermittent connections isn't just about the text and images on your web page. It's also about more interactive content that you might have or any media. And in fact, supporting offline is really critical for fast playback on some of these connections. We talked about earlier how downloads are really common for, as a way for people to access content uh, around the world. And if you support offline, this is in part because playing back video content that has already been downloaded is just much more reliable on these flaky connections or on slow connections. But People are also sometimes totally offline, whether it's on a plane or just running out of your data pack or just having really lousy connectivity and going into airplane mode to maintain your data cost. And so we do have the capabilities on the web to fully support offline media experiences. And what's really exciting here is that one of the challenges we have with supporting offlining of media is that we need to make sure that we're still, as developers, in control of the experience, because there are trade-offs here that you need to make sure you're, you're following the media provider's uh, expectations. And so with background fetch, you actually remain in control. So you can provide these offline experiences to users while still maintaining the control that you need. And this allows users to not only have video content or audio content that works completely offline, but also allows users to have quick playback on any connection type. And we're working on the same concept in Chrome as well. So we have all have the offline dyno game with the, with the great game that I know you all play the physical version over there. Uh, but one of our main principles that we're taking here is we want to make sure users never hit a dead end. So if users do get to a, a page where a service worker hasn't stepped in to help and they are hitting an offline dyno page, we want to help them bridge that gap as well. And so we offer an option for users to choose to download the page when they're online so that when they reconnect, we'll automatically download that page for them and let them know so they can get back to it and continue their browsing experience and so that they can access it even when they're offline. And so this is just one way that we're really trying to make sure that users are not hitting a dead end. And of course, as developers, we'd love for you to address this as well with Service Worker, because this is just our, our one-size-fits-all one solution. And beyond just the options here, we also want to make sure that when users are online and engaging with content, it's the best possible experience for them. And so for the multilingual users and users that speak many languages around the world, we want to make sure that we're tuning our experience accordingly. So, Reiterating here, a first step to a problem is knowing what the issue is. And you have ways uh, to actually know which language or languages your user speaks. So we have the Accept Language header, which will allow you to see what information the browser knows about your user's language preferences. And this doesn't necessarily have to be one language. So for example, right here, we see that the user prefers Danish. Otherwise, they'd be comfortable with British English. And otherwise, they can use English. And so this can just give you a way to understand what your user actually wants and adapt your experience. But sometimes you don't necessarily have information from the Accept Language header. And there's other ways that you can try to figure out what language preferences your users might have. For example, with Search Console, you can see where your users are coming from. So if we look into the countries here, uh, you can tap into this. And then you can easily see the list of countries where your users are accessing your experience. So in this fake example here, we see that users are coming from China, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And you can use this information to understand to what extent is multilingual support critical for your experience, and to what extent is supporting your experience in different languages important. And of course, countries is, is great and can give you a sense of various language diversity of your user base. It's not the end-all solution. Some countries have an incredible amount of language diversity, and just knowing the country-level details isn't sufficient to know which languages to prioritize. But it's a great starting point to understanding where to dig in more and what you should really be prioritizing for your user base or your potential new user base. And if you do see that your users are coming online and using your experience from around the world, and you do want to adapt to support different languages, we have a number of lower level APIs that can help you do so. And so these can help you handle different languages, figure out the right ways to, to pluralize in different languages, appropriately match different scripts, and customize accordingly. So you have the tools in place to also adapt your experience. So the main thing here is by looking at both the storage constraints and leveraging progressive web apps to make sure that users can get to your experience, you can build experiences that anyone can access. 
And if you take into account the data costs and specifically tune it to users who have expressed particular concerns about data, you can make sure that they feel comfortable freely using your experience over and over again. And if you look at memory, you make sure that the experience stays high quality across the board, even when the user is facing memory pressure, and that it's adaptable to all connectivity types, whether it's slow connectivity, intermittent connectivity, or days that they may spend offline. And finally, you can also make sure that it feels personalized and really built for them by making sure you support the languages that they prefer and build experiences that work across all these languages. And when you keep these things in mind, you can build some really amazing experiences. And I just want to highlight a few here from around the world. So one here is Book My Show, which is India's largest ticketing firm. They build a progressive web app that's really smooth and feels immersive like their native app. But it's 54 times smaller than their Android app. And when they launched this, they actually saw an 80% increase in conversion with their progressive web app. And so they were not only able to deliver an experience that had much more reach, but they were able to convert the flows that they needed the most even better. To give another example, we also have Garbarino, which is an online retailer in Argentina that sells everything from home appliances to consumer electronics uh, and pretty much everything in between. And what they've done here is they've actually used Service Worker to cache things, to make sure that they load really, really quickly across all connection types. So not just looking at that offline support, but how Service Worker can be used to speed things up as well. And then there's also companies like Kompas. So Kompas is the largest news site in Indonesia. And what they did is they were able to build a really immersive, progressive web app experience that not only works fully offline, but also sends users notifications when there's most critical information. And by building these sort of engagement aspects that takes into consideration people's connectivity, site, uh, connectivity variations, they actually saw 1.6x increase in engagement as a result of this launch. And these are just some examples. We're seeing this around the world. And what we really see here is that everyone uses the internet differently. And we know that things are changing really quickly, but with the web, we're actually uniquely equipped to help because you're able to reach all of these users that are coming online for the first time and adapt your experience as they're coming online and interacting with it. And with the reality is if you take all of these aspects into consideration, we really do have a worldwide web that works for everyone. Thank you.